ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله so we begin by praising allah and we praise him and we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions anyone whom allah guides no one can misguide and anybody whom allah leaves to go astray no one can guide i testify that allah alone is worthy of worship and that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and messenger what a perfect introduction the khutbah al hajj is for this topic that we're going to be discussing brothers may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you for coming here over these few days we're going to be discussing a very very important subject the subject of da'wa what does da'wa mean to invite exactly brother to invite i tell you what it means though specifically because i remember once when i was renting a flat my landlord was pakistani and i was discussing with him about the importance of da'wah and i was saying brother it's very important we have to give da'wah he said yes of course i will invite you to my house for dinner right so he thought it meant da'wat yeah is it the same in hindi anyway in urdu it means to invite someone for dinner right so this is not a course about inviting people for dinner This is a course about da'wa to Allah. The word has the same meaning, right? Actually the word has the same meaning. Da'wa, da'wa means inviting. So, actually the word itself, mashallah in Arabic, gives us a very good clue about some important principles. We are giving da'wa which means we're inviting people. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "My example is of the person who invited people to a feast." So he actually gave his own example of himself as invitation to dinner. So his da'wah was like a da'wah to dinner. So the Prophet said, "Whoever accepted the invitation ate from the feast. Whoever refused, they refused and they dinner." So this is the situation Subhanallah we are inviting people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can't force anyone to be Muslim. This is a very beautiful thing brothers. Allah has not asked us to make people Muslim. Allah has asked us to invite people to Islam. Of course using all the best methods that we can but our job is invitation. So whoever Allah guides no one can misguide whomever Allah leaves to go astray no one can guide so who is the one who is doing the guiding who is the one who is guiding it is Allah it's Allah we are the inviters Allah is the guide so this is our job actually this makes our task easy alhamdulillah And another thing my dear brothers may Allah have mercy upon you that makes our task very easy is that Islam is the deen of fitra what does that mean does anyone know what that means the deen of fitra it's the natural way of life the fundamentals of Islam that Allah alone is worthy of worship that he is the rub and he is the lord the cherisher the provider the knowledge of this is instinctive and natural in the human being every human being has been created with this knowledge so we are actually reminding people of something they fundamentally already know as long as our method of giving dawa is right okay This doesn't mean that people fundamentally know that pork is haram. 
or that khamar is haram, or that they should wear hijab. They don't fundamentally know that they should pray five times a day and fast a month of Ramadan. No, that is not part of the fitra. Okay, what is part of the fitra or what is part of the natural disposition is the knowledge of a tawheed. That Allah alone should be worshipped, that He is the Lord, that He is the provider. So this is a big clue, brothers. And I know that, inshallah, sisters will be listening and watching. They're not with us today, but inshallah, they'll be watching this series. So we're going to see this, inshallah, because one of the things we're going to be learning in this course is a very, very useful dawah technique. Now, dawah is really an art. It is not something you can learn in a course. It is not something that you learn in a day, or even a week, or even months. It is something that takes a lot of experience, and you will keep on learning. You will never stop learning about dawah. The other thing, brothers and sisters, is that, subhanAllah, you will make mistakes. You will make mistakes. That's going to happen. And I'm going to be interacting with you, so don't run away. You will make mistakes. It doesn't matter. That's okay. The person who never made mistakes in da'wah never gave da'wah. The person who never made mistakes in da'wah never gave da'wah. You're a human being. You're going to make mistakes. The important thing here is to learn from your mistakes, inshallah. Okay? So don't worry about that. Don't worry about making mistakes. It's going to happen. So what is this course about? What is this course about? Okay, first of all, I hope we've clarified what we mean by da'wah. Let me clarify it further. In the Sharia or in Islam, da'wah has quite a wide meaning. The term da'wah has quite a wide meaning. And it encompasses everything that includes enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong calling people to righteousness, teaching, inviting people, all of these things are da'wah. But during this course, we are having a very, very narrow idea of da'wah. We are restricting it. So this course is really about da'wah to non-Muslims. Although there are many Muslims who could probably benefit from what we will be talking about, but what we are really concentrating on in this course is da'wah to non-Muslims or not yet Muslims. Because inshallah we hope they will become Muslim. Okay? So this is really my emphasis in this course. Although some of the things you will learn, you can apply to da'wah in general. But my emphasis in this course is da'wah to non-Muslims. Now... The Prophet wasallam said that Islam will enter every country, every city, every town, every village, every home. Even if there is a home that is made of mud or hair, hair means a tent, there will be a person whom Allah will honor an honor that he gives to Islam, or a person who he will dishonor, that is the dishonor that comes with disbelief. That is going to happen because this is the hadith of the Prophet. And the Prophet ﷺ spoke the truth and he never lied. So Islam is going to enter every home. Now, there's two ways you can look at this, brothers and sisters. Two ways. You can just look at this as an event that is going to happen sometime. That's it. I look at, okay, that's what the Prophet said. That's going to happen sometime. What's another way you might look at this hadith of the Prophet? With another approach, another mentality. What do you think? How else could you look at this hadith? You could look at it, brothers, as an opportunity. Look at the hadith as an opportunity. If the Prophet ﷺ said, Islam is going to enter every home, that's going to happen. So you could have the mentality of, wait a minute, maybe I could be part of 
bringing that into fruition. I can be part of making that happen. You see, you don't look at the hadith in a passive way. You look at the hadith in an active way. Yes, this is how the sahaba used to be. When the Prophet ﷺ used to talk about the people of paradise, and he said there are certain people, they will go to paradise who have these qualities, you will find the companions would jump up and they would say, Oh Messenger of Allah, make dua to Allah that I am one of them. They didn't sit there passively thinking, Oh, there's some information there. No. Their attitude was, I want to be from one of those people. You see, so there was a great leader in Islam. His name was Muhammad al fatih He is the person who conquered Constantinople. He was a young man, I think he was 23 or 24, 25 years old. And he led the army that opened Constantinople, which is today, what is it called? Turkey. No, Turkey is the country. Istanbul. Istanbul. Istanbul used to be called Constantinople. It was the capital of the Roman Empire. It used to be considered impregnable because it had like layers and layers of walls. No one had ever conquered Constantinople. But this man, Rahimullah, Muhammad al fatih he read or heard a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this hadith said, the army that opens Constantinople will be an army of paradise. And he said to himself, I want to be the leader of that army. So he saw the hadith as an opportunity. He didn't just see it as something that was happening. He saw this is an opportunity. Maybe I could be that person. So brothers and sisters who are listening, this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Islam entering every single home, let's look at it as an opportunity. Certainly I have been inspired by this hadith. And when I read this hadith, I began to think about how could we make this happen? How could, through the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how could we make this happen? How could we make this a reality? Now the first thing is, brothers, Hands up who has a mobile phone. Why are you hesitating? What's it like? Why are you looking at everyone else to see? <laughs> if you don't, leave your hand. If you do, put it up. It's not, don't do what everyone else does. It's just that simple. So everyone has a mobile phone, right? So on this mobile phone, you can access the internet, most of you. You can send text messages. Amazing. You can pick up the phone and you can phone your friends and relatives in England and the USA and Australia. Isn't that amazing? That you can communicate with someone almost instantly. It's so fast, it's instant. It's almost instant. I mean, we're talking about milliseconds. It's not even worth counting in human terms. You can communicate instantly with a person on the other end of the planet. And this mobile phone signal can reach, subhanAllah, most places on the earth. You'd have to be very remote these days not to get a mobile signal. You can travel from one end of the world to the other in 36 hours. Maybe a bit more, but even in comparison to 100 years ago, that is so fast. When I flew from New Zealand, 36 hours from London to New Zealand, I think of it as a long journey, but on the way I was thinking, this is amazing. Because how long did it used to take by ship? And before that, subhanAllah, humans were walking and paddling canoes, and I don't know what, how long it took human beings to even get to New Zealand, subhanAllah. But now we can fly there in literally hours that we can count. So this is why they call the world a global village. Increasing numbers of people now have access to the internet. The opportunities for us, even if you don't speak, the language on your phone, your laptop, you have Google Translate. Subhanallah. Okay, it still has to 
develop more, but for basic communication, you can manage. So what excuse is there not to bring this message of Islam? SubhanAllah, brothers, if there was a time in the history of this human race and the history of this planet where the opportunity to spread this message of Islam to every single home exists, that is now. Do you agree with me or not? Alhamdulillah. So, brothers, opportunity. Sisters, opportunity is here. The time is right. And I think there's also other reasons why the time is right. So we don't need to go into them, but I'm sure you can think for yourself. You know, just many things about how the world is today, the way the people think. You know, most people are open to discussion and dialogue. So we have many, many, many opportunities, brothers and sisters. Now, how though is this going to happen? How do you think Islam is going to reach or how do you think Islam could reach every person and every home? So what do you think? You give me some ideas. How can we get Islam to reach every single person, every place, every home? Okay, what other... Let's finish with that. <laughs> so what other things can we use to reach people? The media. So give me some examples. Like, for example... Television, satellite TV. Yes? SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters. Peace TV is amazing, mashallah. When I used to live in London, my next door neighbors were Hindus. And they recognized me from Peace TV. They were Hindus and they used to watch Peace TV. SubhanAllah. In fact, the head of the household... He said to me, he might even be watching this now. <laughs> he said to me, I learned more about my religion, Hinduism, from Peace TV than I did from my own family. And mashallah, he learned a lot about Hinduism from Dr. Zakir Naik, mashallah. So, really amazing the places that the TV can reach, the media, the radio. But think about TV. The problem with TV and satellite TV, what is the problem with that? There's so many other channels, hundreds and hundreds of channels. And most of those channels, what? Music and dancing and movies, you know? It's like a person comes home from a hard day's work. They're so tired. You know, they don't even want to think. But what do they do? They put on the thing and they, what do they want? They want some entertainment. They want some escape. They want some fantasy. So, unfortunately, it's very difficult to engage people in that medium. It's great if they happen to get engaged, but I don't think on its own it's going to be the way that we're going to be able to get Islam to reach every home. So the brother said one to one. And I agree, especially in this modern age, especially in big cities. I don't know about Bombay, but certainly in London, New York, Tokyo, Although Tokyo is not the West, it's very Western. In many of these advanced modern Western cities, you would think that with so many people, people would have lots of friends, yeah, and there would be great communities. No, it's the opposite. One of the biggest problems that people face in cities is isolation. They don't even get to talk to people. They live very isolated lives. But human beings, naturally, they want to talk, they want to share, they want to communicate. Now, in virtually every city, I think every city in the world, there are Muslims. And usually, at least large minorities of Muslims. What if we, as an ummah, could once again take up the duty and obligation of da'wah? What if every single Muslim began to realize that da'wah was an obligation? Just like I have to pray salah, just like I have to give zakah, just like I need to fast Ramadan and make hajj, I also need to give da'wah. 
It's something Allah has ordered me with. Just as I, subhanAllah, have to eat halal meats. You see, Muslims will be so careful. Oh, we'll have to find halal meat to make sure that the meat is halal, that they make sure that there's a, a chain of halal meat for them as if, subhanAllah, most of the Quran was about halal meat. SubhanAllah. But dawah, how come they don't think about dawah in the same way? This is a problem. It is a forgotten obligation. If we could wake these Muslims up, if the Muslims could just begin to realize how important dawah was, And so this is what we need to do. Number one, we need to remind the Muslims. We need to motivate. We need to motivate people to give da'wah. That's the first thing, motivation. But if you have motivation, is that enough just to have motivation? Okay. So we need motivation and we need knowledge. But actually, that's not enough. Even if you have motivation and you have knowledge, you must transform that knowledge into action. And in most cases, in order to be able to transform knowledge into action, you need an environment that allows you to perform that action. If the Muslims could just begin to realize how important da'wah was, And so this is what we need to do. Number one, we need to remind the Muslims. We need to motivate. We need to motivate people to give da'wah. That's the first thing, motivation. But if you have motivation, is that enough just to have motivation? Okay, so we need motivation and we need knowledge. But actually, that's not enough. Even if you have motivation and you have knowledge, you must transform that knowledge into action. And in most cases, in order to be able to transform knowledge into action, you need an environment that allows you to perform that action. So most people, even if they are motivated to give da'wah, even if they have the knowledge, if there is not some environment, and usually that environment, it needs some sort of community, some sort of jama'ah, or what we could call a team. Yeah? So this is the idea. Motivation, motivate people to give da'wah, and you're going to learn about that today. Part of your job as du'at, and every one of you, I want you to start thinking of yourself from now as du'at. This is what is, we're going to be teaching you how to be du'at. I don't mean I'm going to teach you how to stand up on the stage and give a speech. It's nothing, don't worry. It's not about that. Yeah? This is about how to talk to your neighbors, how to talk to your work colleagues, how to talk to your non-Muslim friends, how to talk to people on the street, you could call this street dao. So this is what we're talking about, okay? So alhamdulillah, don't worry, it's not about becoming a speaker. You know, they say that most people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of death. Can you imagine that? That's probably because they don't know what's coming after death. But they're more, can you imagine more afraid of public speaking than they are of death? Although unfortunately for you guys, I am going to make you do some speaking. But that's just to me. Okay, don't worry. In front of us. Just family now, okay? Just you have to relax and enjoy yourself. And not fall asleep. Because you get in trouble, okay? Alhamdulillah. Okay, so the idea is to have dawah teams. Dawah teams in every city, every town, wherever there are Muslims, we need to form these dawah teams. And these dawah teams could or should be hopefully connected with the masjid. The masajid, they need to understand the importance of dawah as well. And they need to get involved in this work of dawah. So 
This is the idea, brothers and sisters, to create a mass movement of doubt. And this is about time the Ummah woke up. But you find that hardly any Sahaba died in Mecca and Medina. Why? Did they not know the virtues of Mecca? Did they not know the virtues of Medina? Yes or no? So then why did they die in other lands? What were they doing? Exactly, they were spreading Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word. They were carrying the religion of Allah because they knew that the virtue of calling people to Islam was far, far greater than... And it also shows, brothers, they had an outward-looking mentality. They were not obsessed and focused about everything the Muslims were doing and whether this and that. No, they were thinking about the benefit that they needed to bring to all of humanity. So this is the perspective we need. We need this outward-looking perspective. We need to refocus on the importance of da'wah. When we do that, I truly believe that you will see a change in the ummah altogether. And one of our problems has been this inward-looking mentality. Now, because I have outlined what this course is about, some vision that, inshallah, we are hoping to materialize. So the idea, as I said, is to have da'wah teams. So, inshallah, we're going to divide ourselves up into teams. Yes, we're going to have teams, inshallah. So, well, it's already very nicely set up. I start from the right, from Yameen, yes? So this is team one, okay? U4 or 5 is team 1. This is team 2. This is team 3. And this is team 4. So the first activity I have for you, inshallah, is very simple. Number 1, between yourselves you have to choose an Amir. Okay? Number 2, you have to choose a name for your team. An Amir and a name for your team. Now, who should be the Amir? Well, it will be good to know what the Amir has to do. Okay? The Amir is going to have to speak on behalf of the team. It doesn't mean he has to speak all the time, but it's his responsibility primarily to speak on behalf of the team. That's the first thing. And the Amir will make decisions. And during discussions... The emir has to make sure that the discussion is controlled and that one person is not talking too much. You see, if I was in the team, probably I would do all the talking. You see, so the emir, his responsibility is to say, Abd Rahim, can you just be quiet for a minute? Because, you know, chupkiro. <laughs> be quiet because someone else has to have a chance to speak. Okay? So that's the responsibility of the emir. Of course, not to tell people, shut up. That's maybe not very polite, okay? But his job is to control the team. So you have to decide amongst yourself who is going to be the emir. So it's not the one with the biggest beard necessarily, or the one who is most good looking, or whatever criterion you choose, or the one who has the PhD, I don't know. No, it's the one who is going to do the job of the emir best. By the way, this, brothers, is all training for our... Vision of da'wah, insha'Allah. Okay? And also you need to choose a name for your team. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that, insha'Allah. Not long. So you can talk amongst each other now and decide who's going to be your emir. And what are you going to call your team, insha'Allah? And I'm going to be giving you points throughout the course. So we'll see at the end who is the winning team. Because we'll have some activities and those activities, whoever does the best in my view will get certain points for those activities. Yeah? Does that sound fun? Alhamdulillah. Okay, go ahead then. So I'll give you a few minutes, insha'Allah. <laughs> Don't forget your other team members over there. Okay, you ready, guys? One more minute.
اوكي غفور رحيم مشفق Everyone ready? We can't take too long. Okay, so team one. First of all, who is the Amir? Uh, so what's your name, brother? Rahib Mirza. And what do you do? I work in research department in IRF. In the IRF research department. And why are you here at this course? To learn the techniques of Dawa. To learn the techniques of Dawa. and to do a profits job and to earn a profits reward mashallah very excellent okay now what is the name of your team hizbul dawa hizbul dawa yeah okay great next team who's the amir of the next team abdullah abdullah mashallah abdullah and what do you do abdullah i'm a student of medicine you're a medic yeah Mashallah. So you're going to become a doctor? Yeah, inshallah. Excellent. And what are you hoping to learn from the course today or over the next few days? Inshallah, I hope to uh, develop techniques to do dawa on one to one basis okay. and inshallah to even become a public speaker. Mashallah, excellent. That's fantastic. Well, certainly will help you with the techniques and I even think that after the end of the course you will definitely get some skills just for learning to speak because we're going to be doing a lot of interactive speaking and activities so inshallah we hope we will get that what's the name of your team abdullah soldiers of peace soldiers of peace it sounds like an oxymoron but okay that's good soldiers of peace abdullah what's your family name abdullah what muhammad ismail abdullah muhammad ismail father's name is muhammad ismail okay Ismail. Yeah, yeah, of course. Alhamdulillah, proper Islamic system there. Good. Yes. This team over here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Arshi Asif Qureshi. Asif is my father's name. Qureshi is the last name. Arshi is A R S H I. Arshi. Arshi. Yes. Okay. Our team's name would be dawa ilallah dawa ilallah okay and arshi what do you want to get from this course i want to learn how to give better dawa better inshallah i like that better dawa okay excellent and the final team team number 4 assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, my name is Ahmed Muhammad Ismail. Ahmed Muhammad Ismail. Yep. And our team's name is One Way to Paradise. It's what? One Way to Paradise. One yeah. Way to Paradise. Okay, excellent. So, I'm going to give you some points already based upon the name that you have chosen for your team. So I'm going to give you some points already based upon the name that you have chosen for your team. Hizb ad-Dawa minus 1. Soldiers of Peace 1 point. Dawa ila Allah minus 1. And one way to paradise 2 points. Mashallah. Why? Can anyone tell me why? Who got minus one and why did they get minus one? Yes. Because uh, the names were in the language which was not understandable to everyone. Thank you very much, brother. Excellent. You see, I want you to think from right now, this moment, as da'is, you are people conveying the message of Islam to non-Muslims. If you'd called your team a Hindi name, I would have given you even more points, because we're in Bombay, right? And I think most people they speak Hindi, not even English. Or maybe in the university, everyone's going to speak English, but on the street, I don't think so. So you have to think as du'a. If you use a lot of Arabic terms, you may be very impressed with yourself using Arabic, mashallah. But when you're talking to 
someone who is not a Muslim, they would just be confused. And this is a problem. MashaAllah, brothers giving dawah, explaining Islam, using a lot of Arabic terms, and the person listening to them is just getting very, very confused. Yeah? So, you need to think from now as people who are giving dawah. You're going to be talking to non-Muslims about Islam. What is the language of your people? What is the language they understand? How are you going to communicate with them? And it's not only about the language, it's about mannerisms, it's about customs. Good dawah takes all of these things into consideration. Okay? So, alhamdulillah, that was a good start. Um, we've got our teams now, and some people are minus, some people are plus. Charlie will have lots of chance and opportunity to catch up. Okay? So, let's have another opportunity. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Inshallah, let's see if we can get some points. So put your hands up. Um, why do we do things as Muslims? That's my first question. Why do we do things as Muslims? Yes, Rahim. Why do we do things as Muslims? In order to uh, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order to please Allah. Excellent. So the reason we do things as Muslims is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do we want? What is it that we want from all of this, these things that we do? Yes. Leisure as well as paradise as a reward. We want paradise, absolutely. We want to go to Jannah. Alhamdulillah. So we want the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, we want to go to Jannah. And of course, we also want to avoid the hellfire. Okay, so in order to get to Jannah and avoid the hellfire, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Someone else. Yes, brother. We need to do good deeds and abstain from evil. Okay, we need to do good deeds. MashaAllah, point for everyone here. We need to do good deeds. Okay, so I'll give you guys a chance now. So you can get two points for this. What are the conditions in order for deeds to be accepted? So in order for a deed actually to be considered to be a good deed... What conditions have to be met? I'll let you guys have a go. Yes. Our act should be according to the Sunnah and Quran. Okay, excellent. So the deed should be according to the Quran and the Sunnah. So that is one condition. The deeds have to be correct. The deeds have to be correct. I've got hands going up here. So pass the microphone. Let's take it down to uh, soldiers of peace. MashaAllah. Peace missile, soldiers of peace, yes. What's the other condition? The deeds must have a good intention. Okay. So we need ikhlas in our niyyah, which means we need to be sincere in our intention. So, brothers, what I want you to do right now, and everybody at home watching on TV, I want you to take a moment to try and make your intention for participating in this and watching this and learning this. My intention is for what? My intention is to learn to make the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest so that I can fulfill the obligation, the obligation, and we are going to show very clearly from the Quran and Sunnah that it's an obligation and to fulfill the obligation of giving dawah. So your intention from the very beginning should be to act on this knowledge. And the other thing is to look in your heart and to try and make sure that you can as much as possible make sure you are doing it for Allah. Not for showing off, not because I want to become known as a da'i, not because everybody's looking at me at the university and thinking, you know, why is Ahmed, you know, not giving da'wah? These are not the reasons. You should do it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, it's very difficult. You can never know 100% that your intention is pure. But this is what you have to try and do. Try and try and purify your intention. So if everyone does that now, inshallah, Really make that intention from now, everyone watching, 
at home, make that intention, take a bit of time to think about that, make that intention pure that you're going to keep watching this series as well, inshallah, to learn how to give da'wah for the sake of Allah. This matter of intention and sincerity, brothers and sisters, believe me, is maybe the most important thing. Because ikhlas and determination in your intention will carry you a long, long way. And it will bring huge blessings to what you do. And you will find the difference between teams and groups of people and organizations who have this ikhlas and they are doing things really sincerely for Allah and others who are doing it because maybe it's just a job or maybe they want to compete, you know, and show off. See, you will find they do not have that same type of barakah, that same type of blessings. And unfortunately, then you might find them arguing with each other and bickering with each other. And they don't get on with other organizations because of whatever reason. Because they're not really doing this for da'wah. They're doing it maybe for their party or for their group or for their firqa, their sect. This is not for Allah. This is for other reasons. So excellent. Okay, so this is very, very important, inshallah, that we're doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, purifying our intentions, correcting, and trying to make ourselves sincere and pure for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now let's go into the virtues of da'wah. Let's talk about the virtues of da'wah. So in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, this is a very beautiful ayah of Qur'an. مَنْ أَحْسَنُوا قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَاعِ Which means, who is better in speech than the one who is calling to Allah? And they do righteous actions. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And they say, verily, I am one of the Muslims. I want to just think about this ayah for a bit, brothers and sisters. Because often you find people say, Dawah is by example. Have you heard that? Dawah is by example. What do you think of that saying, Dawah is by example? The best way to give Dawah is through your example. So what does everyone think of this? Yes. It means to develop a good character so that people uh, see you and imitate you. Okay, that's good. What else? Any other ideas what it might mean, dawah through example? Anything else? Through our behavior, our interactions in the society. Our behavior and our interactions with society. For example, uh, Sahabas, they attracted people towards their way of life by doing business with the local yeah. community, got impressed by their truthfulness. Okay. We know that the best da'i was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. And Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ قَانَ لَقُمْ فِي رَسُولَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا He is the best example. Right. So we do have to set a good example character-wise. Okay. Anyways, we Muslims imitate Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So yep. if we imitate him literally, then we set an example in front of them. Yes. And in that way, we ourselves become an example in front of them. So... That can bring a change in them. Okay. That's it. And we'll be continuing next time, inshallah. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Make sure you all come, brothers. Inshallah. We'll see you then. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لا ينتهي